means implementation using multidiscipline solutions developed by personnel empowered to provide local decisions in a horizontal or matrix structure. Globalization is not new. International trade and investment goes back to the Greeks and Romans. Nations globalized their national security before Richelieu turned it into an art form. Today, issues of world governance are growing and becoming more acute, whether it's eradicating the landscape of landmines, saving rainforests, or assisting emerging societies in embracing world capitalism. And such interdependent causes result in global cooperation. With that said, let's note that globalization is not a move to global government. States will not be surrendering their sovereignties anytime soon. Ireland's recent rejection of the European Union's single monetary policy is a classic example of protectionism still at work. Nations will continue to put their populations and their interests first, whether to protect cultural values, borders, or national pride. And this is a good thing, because national states are still indispensable for providing security and solving problems in areas such as health care, crime, and social services. Nevertheless, we are living in a world in which there is simultaneous integration and fragmentation with traditional lines between that which is considered domestic and foreign breaking down. In many parts of the world, there is an increasing distrust of governments and other institutions. Another negative effect of digital technology, speed, and the reduction of trade barriers has been that as capitalism has spread, the gap between the haves and the have-nots has also grown. This gap has created a fertile ground for the growth of anti-globalization and terrorism. But rather than being protectionist or advocating integration, we must recognize that our world has become interdependent. This means for our mutual security, both economic and personal, we must assure that all the nations of the globe are able to participate in the new economy. This will mean enabling the poorest of the poor to participate by introducing capitalism to every corner of the globe. Economist Hernando de Soto, director of the Institute for Liberty and Democracy, ILD, a nonprofit think tank located in Lima, Peru, believes he has the answer. He thinks that the solution to some of the most troubling economic problems facing poor post-communist and developing countries is rooted in the revision of personal property law. De Soto is the author of The Mystery of Capitalism, Why Capitalism Triumphs in the West and Fails Everywhere Else. For 20 years, he has worked first in Peru and now around the world to help bring market economy solutions to impoverished third world nations. In 1999, Time Magazine picked him as one of Latin America's five leading innovators of the 20th century. Central to DeSoto's work is the idea that poor nations striving to establish Western style democracies with market economies don't have the legal property systems that allow the majority of the people to use what assets they own to raise capital because the rights to possession are not adequately documented. In these countries, assets cannot readily be turned into capital, cannot be traded outside of narrow local circles where people know and trust each other, cannot be used as collateral for a loan, and cannot be used as a share against an investment. In the West, he notes, assets are live and can be used for raising capital to start a business or to buy a home. In developing countries, however, the same assets are dead capital. De Soto worked with President Vicente Fox of Mexico when he was governor, and the Mexican federal government has just hired his think tank to help with property rights issues. He is also working with the Philippines. 
in both countries, 70 or 80 percent of the people operate outside the legal system. In Egypt, which he is also assisting, 90 percent of the population holds its assets outside the legal system. The value of the dead capital in Egypt's real estate market alone is worth 55 times the value of all the country's foreign investment. And keep in mind that Egypt's per capita income of $1,413 is fourth from the bottom of the Middle East's 12 countries. By DeSoto's estimates, the poor of the third world and former communist nations held at least $9.3 trillion in real estate, twice as much as the total money supply circulating in the United States at the beginning of this year. But it is held in such a way that it can't be used to create capital. What will trigger change? Based on history, DeSoto believes change requires two factors, crisis and leadership. Since the primary initiative for reform is a local political affair, DeSoto warns that unless the governments of these people act to help with stable laws, they will face what is happening in the streets of Indonesia and the Philippines. Something for all of us to think about. The fourth and most significant essential of the new economy is client or customer satisfaction. Customers today have better information about products and services and suppliers. A recent article in the Harvard Business Review reports that companies around the U.S. lose half of their customers every five years. In addition to loss of sales, replacing these customers costs four to six times more than retaining an existing one. According to Frederick Reichheld and Earl Sasser, reducing customer defections by as little as 10 to 15 percent can, in fact, double profits. Knowing your customers and satisfying their requirements is key to profitability, therefore. Last year, Cornell's university-renowned School of Hotel Administration dubbed Ali Kasiki, general manager of the Peninsula Beverly Hills Hotel, the overall best practice champion among hotel general managers. He won the award for an innovation that he says didn't cost a dime. A 24 hour a day check-in policy. Because many of the people flying to Los Angeles from Asia, Australia, and New Zealand have to fly all night, they arrive at 9 or 10 a.m., not the usual check-in time. At the Peninsula Hotel, the moment they arrive now, whatever time of day, there is a room available. To make this happen, some maids had to be brought in earlier in the morning, but they like it because they get to go home earlier. The vacuums they use used to sound like 747s, so they switched to handhelds for their 6 a.m. tasks. This new system cost zero in terms of new staffing and computer systems, and guests never have to wait when they arrive although demand for the service has doubled. Kosicki says the funniest thing is that it was simple to do. And he adds that good service is memorable service. You have five senses. Good service is the six. You can't describe it, but you know it when you experience. Good service is also a culture. You can't teach it. All you can do is provide fertile ground so that good service can grow there. To help their customer service activities, many conduct companies conduct assessments to keep their priorities in tune with the market. Of course, a customer satisfaction study in any given year is merely a snapshot. But it is important because customer satisfaction is a moving target. Company performance changes, customer expectations change, and importance ratings change over time. This year's hot button may be replaced next year as performance and requirements change. It's easy to imagine, for example, how a company could perform satisfaction research and determine very little need for improvement in their product delivery process. Then in the space of a year or less, they find their customers have shifted on them 
or a competitor has set a new standard. That is why satisfaction research should be repeated annually. Also why customer satisfaction research that only supports the principles of performance improvement will point the way. It does not always reveal the distance an organization must travel. While the information gathered may show where improvement efforts should be directed, it may fall short of what is needed. Striving to be the best is what is necessary the ability to compare yourself to others. In short, benchmarking. Benchmarking can be done in any of three ways. The first is to benchmark against direct competitors. The second is to benchmark against non-competitive companies who also supply your customer base. And the third is to benchmark against leading corporations who may or may not share your customer base. During a customer satisfaction study, it is easy to benchmark against the competition if customers use two or more suppliers of a product or service. They do not. It is easy to construct a parallel research study of your competitors' customers. Ideally, of course, the respondents in the study would have direct experience with you and with your competition. And remember, benchmarking is not limited to direct competitors. Any supplier to a customer, company's customer base is a potential benchmark candidate. Sometimes non-competitive suppliers to your customers provide a more relevant measuring stick than your direct competitors. For example, you may offer the best technical support in your industry and still be perceived as a poor performer because your industry underperforms. Remember, your customers only know what they directly experience with other suppliers from other industries all of which might exceed your performance. It is also possible to determine how a company stacks up against a number of leading U.S. corporations by constructing a satisfaction index that is comparable with the American Customer Satisfaction Index, ACSI, which was developed by the University of Michigan. Since Michigan's methodology is public domain, it is possible to design a customer satisfaction study in such a manner as to allow a company to be able to compare its performance with such leaders as Nordstrom's, Federal Express, Southwest Airlines, Walmart, the U.S. Postal Service, and many others. I think we'll pause here and give you an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, let's begin with the first question and answer session. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Therefore, we ask that only one question be asked per phone call and that the, these questions be as brief as possible. You may call the studio directly at the phone numbers or fax which appear on your screen. We remind you to make your phone calls at a distance from the monitor to avoid feedback. Um, Jerry, let me ask you the first question before we take one from a site. What do you mean by the phrase continuous improvement? Continuous improvement means um, ig exactly what it sounds like. You continuously attempt to approve, improve your performance uh, by improving the uh, processes that make up your uh, business operation. So if you have a standard benchmark or measure of five, uh, you continuously improve by going to a measure that perhaps is uh, six, assuming six is better. Thank you. Our next question is from Mexico. It's from the Centro Universitario de Tijuana in the city of Tijuana in the state of Baja California in Mexico. Buenos dias. How can a country like Mexico, which politically is in a transition state uh, on a government level, how can Mexico then adapt to all these whirlwind of changes or these radical changes that you are, you are presenting as far as the new economy? I don't know that I'm presenting radical changes. I am, uh, I have in this past presentation, I have, I have shared with you the realities of the changes. Um, Mexico, among uh, the Latin American countries, is, is very much part of the leadership, both in terms of investment and in infrastructure, uh, in uh, such areas as benchmarking, 
in partnering uh, with uh, world-leading organizations. Uh, I think it's a question of continuing that, being open to change. Uh, the two, we'll talk some more in the sec second session about empowerment and involvement of workforces and engagement with customers. Uh, but in my interactions with, with Mexican organizations, uh, I see that happening.